Welcome to AI in the City, uh, New Frontiers in Algorithmic Transparency. So a little introduction. My name is Renata Garica. Um, some important facts about me uh, include that uh, I have a cat named Wolf who is photographed. She is very beautiful and very fierce. Um, in 2023, I watched 275 movies and did a lot of data collection about that. Um, if you want to talk to me about them later, I am always open. Um, it is my second time this year, uh, not second time this year, it is my second time ever presenting at Open Data Week. Last year, I gave a talk about uh, data analytics I was doing at the Mayor's Office of Operations. Um, this year, I am so thrilled to be here in person at School of Data for the first time. Um, and my last fun fact is that I am a native New Yorker. Um, and I have to say that I really did not think that uh, New York City is the best city in the country. I really tried to escape living in New York City. <laughs> um, I went to college out west. I lived in the Midwest for a little while. Um, loved both those places. But it turns out that um, I'm a data scientist and I was really interested in looking at how city um, governments use AI and algorithms in order to make decisions and uh, help provide services uh, to their constituents. And it turns out that New York City is the only place in the world where that is a full-time job you can have. And I have it. And so that is really thrilling for me. I am the, <laughs> I'm thrilled to say that I am the Algorithms Reporting Manager at the Office of Technology and Innovation. And for the past two years, I've had the honor of working on algorithmic tools reporting for the city of New York. Um, first, I was doing that at the Mayor's Office of Operations and now at the Office of Technology and innovation. And, and really, I, my work is focused on answering one question, which is, how does the city uh, use algorithms, um, including, and I say algorithms throughout this talk, but um, I want to make sure that it's clear that that is inclusive of AI and machine learning, but it's not limited to that. So we want to think about the ways that automation is impacting the city um, using all kinds of data analysis. Um, so, so opening our minds beyond the hype of AI, but also being inclusive of it. Um, and so uh, this year, um, in fact, yesterday, um, very excitingly marks the um, fourth year of citywide reporting on algorithmic tools, um, uh, basically telling the public what uh, algorithms are being used to help the city make uh, decisions and, and do service delivery. Um, and this reporting, um, besides being my full-time job, I, I found is really uh, valuable and meaningful for a lot of different reasons. So actually, sorry, there, here's a screenshot, hot off the presses, available as of yesterday, <laughs> um, our fourth year of algorithmic reporting. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about why we report on this. Um, so first off, I, I want to say that uh, uh, I think this is really important because it helps you understand where innovation is happening at the city. So when I talk to young data scientists or old data scientists or whoever wants to get into data analytics um, uh, who are interested in working for the city, um, maybe there are some of you in this audience, I hope there are, um, I, they often ask me where are the best places to work in the city if they want to get into doing really cool data analysis. And I often tell them that actually reading the algorithmic tools report is a really good way to find out where cool analytics work is being done at the city. Um, you can see what agencies are taking the most advantage of new technologies and seeing how they're experimenting with um, different kinds of tools. Um, and so it, it's a good way to start to see, you know, what are the actual use cases um, that are that are impacting residents today. Um, and so then the second thing here is I think that it's really helpful to learn from existing use cases um, as we develop policies and try and support smaller agencies in adopting emerging AI and algorithmic technology. Um, so. I, there's a lot of speculation. Um, I'm sure you've, I, I don't know, I get a lot of email newsletters every day about all the different ways the government could be using AI um, uh, to support uh, service delivery or other aspects of um, citizen experience. Um, but the algorithmic tools inventory shows us where it's actually happening um, today. And so if we're going to be creating policy that helps put guardrails on that usage or 
um, try to expand that usage to other agencies, um, basically helping agencies learn from each other. Um, it's really important for us to know what's actually happening as opposed to what we, we suspect might be happening. Um, and then, uh, and any questions so far? I, they told me I should slow down. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, in the back. Um, I think that is a big question. <laughs> um, I, 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 I don't know that I have like a definition that I go off of. I think it's uh, trying something new, um, trying to procure a new technological solution or build your own um, or even doing a, a new cut of data analysis that people haven't looked at before. I think that it can happen in big ways and small ways. Um, I think the best innovation that happens at the city um, it tends to be quieter um, and also is um, responsive to like, it, again, like to, to problems that we're seeing on the ground. Um, so it's a big question, but yeah. And then. How do you inspect like black box operator systems? That is a big question that is not really um, in the scope of what we're talking about right now. Um, that is complicated. And I, I will say, like, from our position at OTI doing algorithmic tools reporting, um, we don't own the tools and we're not managing um, their, uh, we're not actually managing their deployment. Um, that's the responsibility of individual agencies. So, so that's something that they're concerned with um, more than us. Um, if, sorry, I'm going to keep going, um, but uh, thank you, and I'll keep asking for questions. Um, the other important thing is that um, this helps us uh, provide transparency into how um, government makes decisions um, of, that impact our lives, right? Um, so one of the things, and, and New York has long been a beacon for this kind of uh, transparency, um, New York City, uh, if you work for the city, you will know. If you are adjacent to the city, you will know. There's a lot of compliance reporting. <laughs> there are a lot of local laws out there that are having agencies um, get together and write reports about what the work is that they're doing. Because the city controls a lot of money and touches a lot of people's lives. And so it's, it's really important for us to um, engender trust through compliance reporting like the reporting that I'm talking to you about today, but also uh, compliance reporting on one of my favorite uh, compliance reporting that is not my own is um, on language access um, and how cities, um, agencies are making their resources available in other languages. Um, so, so that's a huge legacy in the city. Um, open data is obviously a huge part of that legacy. Um, and so, uh, so, so algorithmic tools reporting is just one small part. And it's actually through that that I got to realize the, the first way that my life was impacted by an algorithm used by the city, which is when I applied to high school almost 20 years ago. Um, and even 20 years ago, long before the public had any understanding of AI and what that was, um, the Department of Education uses an algorithm. It's a, you know, I, I think like the, the, really cutting edge data scientists might scoff <laughs> and say, uh, that's not, that's like just a fancy matching algorithm. But it, you know, it's really important and it really uh, impacts the lives of New Yorkers and, and understanding that that uh, touched, you know, my process of going to high school um, was really meaningful to me. And, and it's actually that algorithm in particular um, inspired the reporting that we're here to talk about in the first place. So I wanna give a little bit of a history lesson um, and it is going to start with a little bit of Civics 101, um, which when we're talking about things at the city, um, one of the things that I think is most important to understand is sort of what are the levers of power that we have working and, and why are agencies able to do or encouraged to do the things that they do or don't do. Um, and, and there are two that are of particular interest to this talk today. Um, so New York City voters, I hope many of you are in the room, I am one of them, um, elect two uh, different positions. Um, we elect our mayor and we elect uh, city council members. And those two um, offices have very different um, ways that they can make policy to create change in the city. Um, the mayor can uh, create policy through executive order, um, which is really great and how a lot of incredible um, policy changes happen. 
um, and city council can, uh, on their end, pass local laws. Um, each of these are, uh, you know, subject to change under uh, other uh, future administrations. But um, you can imagine that when it is just a mayor making a decision, um, there's a lot more likelihood that an executive order may be changed in the future than a local law where you would have to get council to like pass another law. Um, so, so executive orders and local laws are two different kinds of policy making mechanisms that um, are the reason why our report exists today. Um, so we're going to start back in 2018. Um, in 2018, there was a lot of public interest in um, starting apocryphally, uh, not Necess I, I cannot speak to the veracity of this, but um, uh, around the New York City public schools uh, matching algorithm and uh, a lot of public interest in general about how uh, cities were the city was using computers to make decisions. And so council passed a law that um, created the Automated Decision Systems Task Force, which was responsible for reviewing the city's use of automated decision systems, um, including but not limited to artificial intelligence, um, and that committee was made up of representatives from various government agencies, as well as um, partners from the private sector, uh, nonprofit advocacy and research communities. Um, and what that uh, task force did was um, put forth a series of recommendations um, that uh, led Mayor de Blasio in 2019 to adopt and sign into law Executive Order 50, which created the Algorithms Management and Policy Office. <laughs> um, and that office was responsible for aggregating the first collection of algorithmic tools, uh, the first algorithmic tools directory basically in the world, um, which is very exciting. And that first, sorry, that says 2021, but it should, uh, sorry, it was published in 2021, but it's about the tools that were used in 2020. So the first report was published in 2021. It included 16 tools from nine agencies. And I will say it's much more limited in scope than we have now. Um, it really focused on algorithms that were using a, um, uh, that we're using particularly advanced analytics or machine learning, um, and also algorithms that we're using, uh, or algorithms that we're using data uh, that included identifiable information. Um, so the scope was pretty narrow, and that was by design. We wanted to get agencies used to the idea of what an algorithmic tool was and thinking about how these tools may be already or used in their offices and what it might look like to start reporting them to the public. Um, this reporting was really the first of its kind. And um, it, while it was done uh, and designed in, in conversation with a lot of with some other municipalities, um, it was really a, a game changer in terms of like the scope and uh, and uh, depth of reporting. Um, and then in uh, 2022, uh, Local Law 35 was enacted. So instead of having a, a, a reporting regime that was decided by an executive order, we now actually have a local law, 35 of 2022, um, which requires that every agency report, <laughs> um, requires that every agency report um, to the mayor and city council on all the algorithmic tools that they have used in the past year um, to make decisions that impact the public. Um, in that same year, um, in January of 2022, um, Eric, our mayor, Eric Adams, also published um, Executive Order 3, which, um, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, which established the Office of Technology and Innovation, where I now work, and made algorithmic tools reporting the responsibility of that office. Previously, it resided in the mayor's office of operations, fun fact. Um, so that leads me to a small interlude. Uh, any questions, actually? That's a good point. <laughs> yeah, in the back. Yeah, so Local Law 35 is basically taking the reporting requirements about algorithmic tools and making that an actual legal requirement as opposed to an executive order. Um, so it it has, a, and we'll go into the details of it a little bit later, um, but it has a specific definition for an algorithmic tool and specific pieces of information that it requires that agencies report out to um, the public on an annual basis. Yeah. Um, so I have a question about the 
to hear a little bit more detail because there's definition on yeah. that. Um, I'm curious if there was like an implementation timeline because I noticed in the summary, like there are lots of agencies that are reporting zero tools and that seems unlikely to actually be true. So I, so the reporting requirement, they have one year to, you know, they, every year they have to report on their tools. There wasn't, I mean, there was maybe a year I mean, you can see the timeline of like when the laws get published versus when we start reporting. We started reporting the following year. Um, so I, there are a lot of agencies that report zero tools. And I, I will say from working with those agencies, I, I believe them. Um, I think that a lot of agencies are very, you know, a lot of agencies are really small and have limited resources. So they're not necessarily, they don't necessarily have um, data scientists who are, working for them full time to do the kind of work that would deploy these tools. Another thing is that the remit of Local Law 35 is actually pretty specific. Um, so we'll get into that later, but um, there, it, it is not every single algorithm that is used by the city that gets reported under Local Law 35. Um, anything else? Yeah, one more in the back. Are there any agencies that are exempt from having to report what algorithms are used? Not under the Local Law, no. Um, the question was if there are any agencies that are exempt. No. Um, and that is also something that is kind of unique for the city, I will say. Um, so cool. A little interlude into what OTI is. Um, but uh, basically, uh, prior to, to Executive Order 3, um, a lot of the city's uh, technical workforce was siloed in a lot of different um, areas of the city. Um, Executive Order 3 brought all of those... Um, uh, places into one shop, now known as OTI, that is focused on making government run better and bridging the digital divide. Um, we are led by our CTO, Matt Frazier, um, and we coordinate technology-related projects across and policy across city government. Um, OTI includes uh, Cyber Command, the Office of Information Privacy, the Office of Data Analytics, which is part of the reason why you all are here today, that runs uh, Open Data Week and runs the Open Data Portal. Um, and the legacy Department of Information Technology and Communications, 311, and then where I sit in strategic initiatives. Um, next, that is uh, in October, uh, to go back to our timeline, in October 2023, um, OTI published New York City's AI Action Plan, which is um, the nation's first comprehensive plan to ensure responsible use of AI at the city government level. Um, that plan includes 37 actions um, toward that uh, help are going to help us develop policies around AI development and procurement, um, help support public education efforts, uh, share knowledge across agencies, and much, much more. Um, we have been hard at work <laughs> on uh, implementing the actions of the action plan, and we have a lot of work uh, coming ahead, uh, but my team is ready to take it on. Um, and, and foundational to all of that work is having a directory of algorithmic tools. So again, like I said earlier, we can know what's actually happening on the ground and where are agencies doing um, cool projects that other agencies might be able to learn from. How can we share this? It, you know, it is a huge public transparency effort. Um, so all these things tie together and, and the local law 35 uh, reporting is really foundational to that, that effort. Um, finally, um, one, in line with one of the actions from our action plan, the algorithmic tools reporting data that we published yesterday is now available on open data for the first time. So we're really excited about that. Um, and you'll be able to examine that data not just through like a PDF report, but actually start to do some interesting analysis uh, with that data. Um, so that I'm very excited about. You can clap for that. That's a huge accomplishment. <laughs> Thank you. I was very excited. Um, so now let's, uh, I'm going to dig in actually to the actual reporting that we have this year and tell you some of the findings that we have um, and start with like, what is the actual definition of algorithmic tools? Um, I will say, so, so this comes out of local law. Um, so this was written by city council and, and our role at OTI is to, to take the law, help agencies understand the law and interpret it 
and then um, collect that reporting and make it access as accessible to the public as possible. Um, so, so just so you have a sense of like sort of the, the mechanisms at play here. Um, I'll, I'll read it out. Um, uh, any technology or computerized process that is derived from machine learning, artificial intelligence, predictive analytics, or other similar methods of data analysis that is used to make or assist in making decisions about and implementing policies that materially impact the rights, liberties, benefits, safety, or interest of the public, including their ability to access available city services and resources for which they may be eligible. Um, so that's a, a, a mouthful. <laughs> Um, but when we talk to agencies, we narrow it down really to three key elements. Um, your, your tool has to use uh, data analysis. It has to be used to assist in decision making. So um, that sort of goes back a little bit to your question. There are a lot of places where agencies may be using algorithms to give them information, but it's not actually being used to like make a decision about policy. Um, necessarily. It can like provide more information, um, but it actually has to finally um, materially impact the public. So really impact the distribution of resources um, or uh, something else. So there are other tools, like one particular example of things that are like you are algorithms that the city uses, but might not be reported are tools that help with like the internal processing of documents. Um, are, are, is the sort of thing that might exist at the city, but is not really in the scope of reporting for this local law. Um, there are a couple other highlights from the reporting that I, I think is really valuable and makes New York's reporting really unique and special. Um, the first is that we get participation from every agency and the mayor's office. To the question we had earlier, there are no exceptions to that rule. Um, and, and, so the, and the scope is like very clear and spelled out in the law. Um, another is that it is updated on an annual basis. Um, we start collecting um, reporting in the fall. It's due officially by agencies by law um, by December 31st. And then we have to release the report by the end of March. Um, we were a week early this year. <laughs> um, so that so the nice thing about that is that you know exactly when this reporting is being updated and that it is reliably being updated every single year. Um, one thing that we are doing also, which is not a requirement of the law, but is something that we really strongly believe in, is that we are expanding on the reporting details. There are, were four questions this year that were asked of agencies for each of their tools that were not asked in previous years and are not a part of the scope of the actual law itself um, that we think are going to help um, make the reporting uh, both uh, more under useful to the public, also more useful internally for us to think about how do we categorize these tools and measure their impact, and eventually will help us support help support our um, governance efforts. Um, and finally, as I said before, we are now shared on open data. Um, so any questions about uh, sort of the basics of the law? Yeah. Uh, does, does your office or does anyone help these agencies in evaluating whether their tools meet these three criteria? I, you know, yeah. I can imagine, you know, I'm kind of struggling to think about various tools where I'm like, okay, I know this tool exists at this agency. Does that fall under this category? Yeah, so that's most of my job <laughs> is uh, I we have a lot of documentation internally that sort of helps walk agencies through um, the questions they might ask internally and, and who are the people that they should be targeting in their agencies who are going to be best able to evaluate whether work that they're doing meets this criteria. Um, it helps that, you know, I think that every year, you know, more tools are reported. And I think part of that is that more people in agencies, like the awareness is higher and the understanding of what it is that we're talking about is higher. And that helps us a lot with um, making sure that the, the reporting is uh, robust and thorough. Um, yeah. Um, so obviously a substantial amount of city decisions about policy and planning happens through consultants that the city contracts. Yeah. Uh, so are the respective agencies also required to ask for reporting from the consultants? Yeah, so um, the reporting comes from the agencies, but tools that are built by vendors are reported and they do have to disclose vendor involvement. And so you, there is a field that says, um, and this is required by the law. If there's a vendor, who is the vendor and describe their involvement. Um, so, so that is information that you will find in this reporting. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, 
So just looking at the requirements on the left, um, like I would say like using an Excel sheet is data analysis, right? And now whatever job we do in city agencies, it, it will impact policy making and therefore materially impact the public. So what is not included? <laughs> yeah, so I think that's a really hard question. And I think that there is some variability in agency interpretations of, of those things. Um, our guidance is that we generally want it to be a, a, a a little bit more sophisticated analysis than just a filter on an Excel spreadsheet. Um, but, uh, you know, it, just because you're doing something in Excel doesn't inherently mean that um, that is it's not sophisticated analysis. Like you can run a linear model in Excel or do weird. I mean, you could do deep learning in Excel. I'm not sure that you would, but <laughs> indeed you could. Um, so and then and then material impact of the public is something that actually we're really interested in, um, how we can provide better guidance on this in the future. Um, this, again, this is how the law is written. Um, I totally agree that there is a spectrum of ways, like there, there are some tools that you'll, you can read about where it's extremely clear, like how this has an immediate impact on, um, on people like like the school's algorithm decided where I went to high school <laughs> um, and but there are some where the the impact is a little bit um, several notches removed and so that is something that we're definitely interested in thinking about um, how can we um, put categories to that or um, better define what the layers of influence are so that agencies can, um, you know, uh, be transparent and also like give agencies a better way of thinking about impact. Um, one more and then I, I want to keep going. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm wondering, maybe you'll be providing an example of like what does or doesn't fit in or if Yeah, 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 I definitely have examples. <laughs> There are concerns about how this is written if like, sorry to go back to my previous question, like agencies that have reported zero tools include DOT, DSNY, DCP, DCAS. Like these are very big agencies that are definitely using algorithm, algorithmic tools. Yeah, I, well, so their reporting is, um, uh, submitted by their general counsels. So, you know, we we don't have an audit capacity at the city. And so, um, you know, at some point we have to trust them with what they tell us. We definitely do um, regular engagement with these agencies to make sure that they're um, complying with the law. But, uh, and, and you know, we, we trust their general counsels when they submit to us. But that, that's ultimately, you know, the work that the, the agencies are responsible for doing that work. Um, so yeah, uh, so just a preview of the data set being up on open data, which is really nice. And I'm going to dig into some numbers. Um, so, so this year's report um, was record breaking. Um, we had 46 tools that were reported from a record 16 agencies. Um, which was really exciting for us this year. I, I do make a difference between um, the two reports that were done under EO50 and the two that were done under Local Law 35, because again, they did have different requirements for what uh, counted as an algorithmic tool with um, Local Law 35 being um, more expansive than, um, than under EO50. Um, and then uh, if we look at the breakdown by agency, these are a lot of acronyms, but I'm happy uh, if you have any questions about specific ones. Um, the thing that, this was fascinating to me. So DOHMH is the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, far and away um, reports the most tools each year. Um, the reason for that, if you dig into the reporting, is they, they report a lot of algorithms about genetic sequencing. Um, they're using really advanced technology to, um, uh, in particular, so, so sorry, step back. I forgot that I put the examples in here late last night. Um, one of my favorite uh, DOHMH tools is um, improving foodborne disease outbreak detection by um, incorporating complaints identified in social media data. Um, so basically there's a tool at DOHMH that uh, previously scraped Twitter, no longer has access to their API, but scrapes information from Yelp um, to... Uh, capture um, 
foodborne illness, so uh, possible E. coli complaints, basically, um, that are that they might not see through 311 data um, in order to try and triangulate where um, there may be disease outbreaks in the city. Um, but most of their reporting actually looks a little bit more like this, <laughs> um, where they're they're taking genetic data and a lot of this technology, I had to do a lot of Googling because I had not heard of any of this before. It was not my area of data science. Um, but basically um, taking DNA samples and figuring out um, which uh, types of COVID um, people we might be finding, for example, in wastewater or in other locations. Um, and, and this is an example, I think, where the immediate decision that's being made by this algorithm, which is um, what type strand of COVID um, is found in some sample of DNA, um, that immediate decision does not have an impact necessarily on the public. It's not like processing COVID tests. Um, but what it does do is that reporting gets wrapped up and in, in a lot of cases is like sent to other agencies or the federal government and they in the big picture um, be impacting like what vaccines get made or how do we allocate uh, funding to, to prepare for COVID hotspots or, or other uh, pieces of information. I can't speak to exactly how this information gets used. I'm not a representative of DOHMH. I don't work on this algorithm, um, but that's the kind of information that we're gleaning from this reporting. And again, I think this speaks to um, the importance of knowing what's actually happening at agencies. Um, when I'm thinking about AI governance or, or when I'd been thinking about AI governance up until this year, um, I, I'm thinking about um, I don't know, predictive modeling or uh, other types of, uh, or, or root automation and prioritization is another big one and other forms of resource allocation. I was not thinking about genetics algorithms. Um, but if the governance that we're creating as a city for how um, to deal with AI um, are not inclusive of genetics algorithms, then we're not doing our jobs and we're ignoring actually a huge amount of what's being reported at the city and is being actually used day to day by the city. Um, so, so that's something that's really important to us. Um, just a little bit of statistics that, um, the statistics, I, frequencies <laughs> that uh, came out of some of the more categorical uh, questions that we asked this year. 47% of the tools um, were created or are maintained with vendor contractor support. Um, if you work for the city, this probably sounds a little low. If you work, do not work for the city, this may sound very high. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, we know that we do rely a lot on, on vendor support for a lot of advanced analytics, and we see that in our, in our data. 38% um, of our tools were updated with more information this year, often like using new data to retrain their models, which is very exciting. Um, and 36% of these tools um, collect or analyze identifying information as defined by the city's um, Identifying Information Act, um, which deals with information privacy. Um, that again, I think is a really important statistic for transparency and, and for thinking about you know, the work that our partners at the Office of Information Privacy do. Um, really important to have that transparency in, in the kinds of data that are being used by these tools. Um, any questions? I know that, like, you're like, it's the agency's job to report these tools, and I know you've got a bunch of questions about this, but hopefully you can, like, talk about uh, whether there's any sort of, like, enforcement or, let's say the comptroller goes to, like, DCAS, and it's like, yo, DCAS, like, these are algorithms, like, by law you should be publishing these. Is there some? Is there any sort of like mechanism to? Yeah, I mean, I, I, they're welcome to report. You know, like they we we take reporting and it's done in conversation over a period of many months. Um, you know, we I, we also get um, reported algorithms that we actually in conversation with agencies will say actually this isn't quite the right fit for the reporting that we're doing, um, and and probably isn't included by the law. So. Um, you know, we're, we're always open to having these conversations with agencies, whether those conversations are inspired by the comptroller's office or somebody else, you know, we're, we're happy to talk with agencies about whether tools are appropriate for local law 35 reporting. Okay. Yeah. So that's about like having a conversation with them is like, is there any like mechanism that would make an agency publish it once it's been like identified, like this is an algorithm to like 
force their hand to publish it. Yeah, I, I mean, they they have to publish it, and we, we do tell them, <laughs> them that that is the local law. So, I mean, I, I don't know necessarily, I, I don't really have, a, I, I don't know what it would look like for something that wasn't being published to, like, I don't totally know what that would look like in terms of legal mechanisms where, where we can't, we wouldn't want to like, I don't know what, <laughs> like, we wouldn't sue them. I, I'm not sure totally what that would look like. But, um, you know, we, as things come to our attention, we do bring it up with agencies to our abilities. Yeah. Um, I, I had this question inspired by the um, COVID um, yeah. algorithm you shared, but maybe it applies to other areas too. Um, so with that example, do you also, um, like, do they report kind of how the sampling is done too, or is it more like once the sample is drawn, then you just look at the algorithm after that point? So we, one of the request, uh, problem, uh, one of the things that is required by the law is to report on the kinds of data that are used and input into the tool and analyzed by the tool. Um, agencies do have a fair amount of leeway with how they answer that question, so we get pretty different um, kinds of responses. Um, some of them are very specific about like actual variables that they're using to input their data. Um, not so much sampling techniques, um, less of that. It's more um, sort of thinking about like what kinds of information are going into these tools. Um, so yeah, there's no information for DOHMH um, when it comes to like thinking about the input data. It's not like, where is this coming from? I think that's like a different part of the pipeline. We are more focused on like the, the algorithms themselves, um, but that's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, one more in the back and then I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> Yeah, so we think uh, uh, tools, uh, algorithmic systems, it, it, this is something that's really hard, I think genuinely, um, is sort of what are the bounds on what you're thinking of as a tool or system? Um, because a, a lot, like for example, with the DOHMH um, genetic sequencing algorithms, um, a lot of those algorithms are probably working in sequence with each other um, to do different parts of the genetic sequencing that then come into a larger system that is doing the actual resource deployment, right? Um, and the, the individual reporting that we have right now doesn't like necessarily uh, make that flow clear. Um, I, I think that's a, a hard part about doing this work in general, um, is that what the bounds are of, you know, when does this analytics process start and where does it end is, is something that's actually like very fuzzy. Um, and so it, I think that the answer is like, yes, that is hard. Um, I, I don't have a perfect answer to it. I think that you'll see that the ways that agencies are thinking about this, I think it does differ um, both depending on the work that they're doing and on, um, and, and just, you know, their style um, and their own interpretations of the law. Um, cool. So I'm going to move ahead. Um, two of the interesting types, and I, I will say these are, are not my favorite taxonomies, but they're interesting, and I think we have learned something from using them. Um, uh, a new question that we asked this year um, that sort of came out of uh, legacy EO50 um, reporting is what is the analysis type of tools that were used, and um, also what um, type of population was impacted by this tool? Um, and we got really interesting responses. Um, pre I, the categories that you see here for analysis, I, I'll read them out. It's predictive modeling, matching, optimization, speech and language processing, computer vision, and other is something that we're actively right now working on updating. It, these are not categories that are well-defined. Um, we did not proactively define them with agencies. It was up to them to sort of interpret and report, uh, although we did work with them a little bit if we felt that um, categories weren't quite the right fit. Um, the majority of, of tools are doing some, predict some sort of predictive modeling. Um, but again, um, one of the things that I learned when I was going through all the DOHMH reporting is that these taxonomies are not really robust to genetics al sequencing algorithms. And so how do we, um, if we're thinking about 
um, what kind of AI are we dealing with, which I like is a nebulous concept, even if you are yourself in this, in, like deep in this industry. Um, like, how do we come up with categories that are relevant for the ways that city government in particular is using these tools um, is something that uh, we are actively thinking about. But I think this is an interesting place to start. Um, and then uh, also the, when we're looking at the impact type, um, you'll notice that uh, the second largest category, which I love a good taxonomy, but the second largest category is other, and that's horrible. <laughs> um, and I can tell you the reason is because um, as DOHMH was very insisted on pointing out, when they're doing DNA sequencing, that DNA doesn't necessarily have to have come from an individual. It could come from any species. Um, so I think that um, that showed us that our um, the ways that we were thinking about population types um, uh, definitely could be a little bit more robust to what we're actually seeing on the ground. Um, also, um, a lot of these have in impacts on individuals, so that's really important. Um, but the other categories, the, the impact on geographic space and groups, organizations, or businesses are, are use cases that I also find really interesting. Um, and I have two examples. So um, obviously, speech and language processing is something that I think is a new category. <laughs> not, it's not a new category for us this year, but it is something that is newly prescient in the news. Um, and it, it's been really exciting to see the ways that agencies are experimenting with generative AI. So the agency that I'm at, um, OTI, does report um, the My City chatbot which was um, started uh, getting used in September of 2023 and was announced actually alongside the AI Action Plan and helps um, people ask, uh, ask questions about um, policies around starting businesses or getting um, support for their small businesses in New York City. Um, so that's been a really exciting pilot to chat, uh, to track and see how it goes and see what we can learn from that we can share with other in agencies that are also interested in experimenting with generative AI. Um, and then also, um, I wanted to share an example of one of the few algorithms that doesn't necessarily have an individual impact, but um, is included um, because of its uh, impact on uh, geographic space. And it's an algorithm that I actually worked on when I was at the mayor's office. Um, Scorecard is a program where um, we actually will send a team of raiders out to every single block face in New York City um, to uh, basically rate how clean the street is. Um, that information is actually available on open data. Um, and the ways that it uh, samples uh, block faces is algorithmically driven um, to, in a way that it's kind of funky, but um, is trying to to address to oversample areas that are more trafficked. Um, and so the ways that it's figuring that out and then weighting um, how it chooses each month what block faces the raiders actually go to counts as an algorithmic tool. Um, so I can pause and ask questions, and then I want to talk about the future. <laughs> Anything? OK. Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, thank you. Uh, so I know the uh, intention for reporting is obviously increase transparency and hold agencies accountable um, for decisions that involve um, you know, the public. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other side of the coin, this is extra work for agencies. Yeah. And potentially, you know, someone working at the agency could just be like, oh, I just want to keep doing things ad hoc basis using Excel so that I don't have to subject myself to this, like, this kind of reporting. So, like, would that hinder potential innovation? Yeah. So I think that's a really good question. I think that's a part of why we've been really intentional with how we've rolled out reporting at the city, um, where um, we started with a very narrow set of tools that we were looking at, and we've broadly, broadly, slowly expanded over time what we're looking for. Um, I have never gotten feedback from an agency that uh, our reporting requirements are so burdensome that it's keeping them from doing innovation. And if we ever came up with a reporting, I mean, we certainly could come up with reporting requirements that would be so burdensome that it would keep agencies from reporting. But that is not our goal. And, and we do actually take that very seriously. Um, I spend a lot of time trying to make this process as easy for agencies as po possible, including like 
pre-filling workbooks so that all their reporting from last year just gets carried over to this year. And then they can tell us if tools are no longer in use or if something needs to be updated. So um, we do work really closely with agencies to make sure that even though, you know, this is a burden, you know, there's no, not no burden, um, but to minimize the burden of reporting as much as possible because um, and every time I have a conversation with an agency about adopting uh, or looking into a new algorithmic tool or AI technology, I always say, hey, guys, I just want to pop it in, remind you, you might have to report this under the local law next year, but I never want that to be an obstacle to you adopting a tool. Um, I, I don't think that we would see, I, I don't think that like just simply using a spreadsheet instead of using Python code would be like sufficient enough to keep them from reporting. I think that agencies generally kind of get it. Um, personally, I, I, I just haven't seen that happen yet, but it is something that we do think about and take very seriously. Um, yeah, in the back. Is there plans for potentially releasing the actual models not at this moment. I think that's something that, um, you know, we get a lot of, of feedback that that's something people are really interested in. I do think that would keep agencies from reporting things. <laughs> um, and I, uh, maybe I, I shouldn't say that, but um, I... I think that in a lot of cases, especially where we're doing work with vendors, um, that code is actually not proprietary to the city and so not able to be released to the public. And so um, it depends a little bit on the specifics of the tool, but I think that we'd have a lot of trouble with that. Um, to, just to be like totally honest, you know? Um, but in terms of what we are actually planning for the future, um, we release the AI action plan. I mentioned a lot of these bullet points earlier, um, 37 actions, uh, commitments to establishing AI governance practices in New York, and this tool directory is really foundational to that work. Um, there are four, tool, four uh, actions that I think really directly speak to the work that I've talked about today. Um, 1.4 is, uh, that we want to have a typology of AI projects that goes into thinking about analysis types um, and also impact types. So how are we um, how are we categorizing these algorithms by different levels of risk or different inputs, outputs, or populations that are impacted, and and different ways of understanding like the level of that impact. Um, 1.5 is directly about um, this reporting and, and thinking about expansion. Um, do we want to be including more tools? What information might be useful to collect about these tools that we're not already uh, collecting? Um, one of my like talking points here um, that we just discussed is like, how do we create greater transparency without creating so much of an agency burden that it, it discourages innovation? That is again, something that is extremely top of mind for us. Um, and then also, what can we learn from reporting in other municipalities um, and, and particularly paying attention to what's happening at the federal level um, in these areas? Um, 1.6 does com commit us to developing an AI risk assessment and review project review process. We're really looking forward to uh, putting our heads down on this one and, and helping agencies think about how to mitigate risk when they're dealing with uh, AI and, and other algorithmic tools. Um, and finally, designing and building a public facing website, um, which is not quite directly uh, related to this work, but is very important to it. Um, right now, you know, we, we have our PDF report, which I think is really great. I'm very excited that we're now on open data, but I, I'm always thinking about how we can make this reporting more accessible, not only to technical audiences, but also to non-technical audiences who are maybe more likely to be impacted by, by the work that agencies are doing. Um, and I, I really want this reporting to be, be accessible re regardless of, of technical background. Um, and I think that having a really engaging public website could be a, a cool part of that. Um, I, I do want to talk a second a little, a, a little bit about the work that inspires us and, and sort of shows off um, how New York is the best at this, but also um, gives us some ideas for, for where we might expand. Um, Helsinki and Amsterdam are two European cities that were really co-innovators in this space um, and have done a lot of work on algorithmic tools transparency and how do we think about reporting on algorithmic tools. Um, but they, they currently are reporting very few tools. So I think Helsinki reports maybe eight tools. Um, one of them is like chatting with your parking meter um, through an app. 
uh, and and it's unclear uh, just like going through their website how that information is maintained, like how often that gets updated. Um, I, I like the information layout a lot. I think it's a, a lot more like visually pleasing to look like, um, but sometimes it doesn't quite have the, the substance that I'm looking for and, and not as much. I, again, like we're very lucky that we have this local law because it means that it's very clear, hopefully, that like when you can expect this information to be updated and what the scope of information that's included is. Um, whereas, it, you know, in other places that are just opting to do this um, out of, uh, you know, some initiative within their IT departments or wherever, um, it's not always necessarily clear what the scope is of um, their reporting. Um, another really big example for us right now is the U.S. federal government under Executive Order 14110 um, that uh, President Biden uh, passed earlier um, this year, last year. I, I don't know what year it is anymore. Um, I... Agencies are now required to publicly post their own algorithmic tools directories. Um, I've done a lot of digging around here. Um, the number of tools, uh, when I first drafted this report um, that is reported by the federal government right now is 851. Um, I shared that number with a, a group of responsible AI folks uh, earlier this week, and they all thought that was really low, but I was really impressed. Um, and but, but none of this information is unified. Um, Every single agency is sharing um, their own information on their own websites, and they're often doing it in different ways. So some of them are PDFs, some of them are Excel spreadsheets. One is on open, an open data portal, the Department of Transportation, which I love that for them. Um, but uh, <laughs> but I, I would really love to have this information all aggregated in one place. And they also, I, they're all clearly like following the same template and the same set of recommendations from the federal government, but they um, don't all share the same information publicly. So some of them will only share like the name of the tool and a description of it. Some of them will have more information about like the kinds of input data and what type of AI analysis is going on here. So there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here. I'm really curious to see how this develops. And I do think that there are questions that the federal government is asking that we're not, that I'm definitely interested in considering having next year. Um, and then finally, um, another really interesting example is the Canadian federal government um, has on their open government portal um, actual full, um, what do they call them, algorithmic impact assessments, which are actually really pretty long, thorough reports um, uh, looking at the impact of algorithmic tools. One thing that I cannot say is what the scope of this is at all. There are 17 tools reported. I do not know if that is all 17 tools that Canada is using or if there is more that is not reported. I don't know how often this stuff gets updated. That's not clear, but what is included in the reporting is really fascinating um, and very detailed. I don't think that that is something that we could ever approach to doing with local law 35, again, because I, I do think it, it tends into the like overly burdensome, but are there um, templates that we can give agencies to empower them or encourage them to think, uh, uh, to, you know, design their project process um, with, you know, certain questions in mind. Like, that's definitely something that we're interested in. Um, and also, there are some really interesting just general case studies in there and learnings to be had. And, and I think that one of the things is we're thinking about knowledge sharing within the city um, is how can we um, get really good case studies from agencies to share that information with other agencies who might be interested in similar analytics. Um, I've gotten a lot of questions from you guys throughout that have been really great questions. Um, I am ready to take more questions, but I also want to shout out my coworker, Paul, um, who is also on my team, is talking about um, our smart city test bed. Uh, at 345, and you should all go to his talk. And thank you all for coming to mine. It means a lot. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, my name is Siegfried. I am a data analyst and designer for the Parks and Rec Department. Awesome. And so, yeah, so you mentioned that um, I know that there are various teams that are dedicated to. Um, data algorithmic tools and analytics such as OTI, of course, but the majority of teams that work within various agencies around the city, the majority of teams, like as somebody mentioned, their analytics tool set is very much limited to Excel. Mm -hmm. right? And best yeah. scenario, they probably use a Tableau 
or something, right? Yeah. So I know you, my, I guess my intended question is what exactly is the plan to ensure that everybody is AI driven? And I know you mentioned the AI action plan. Yeah. And, but you also mentioned that you didn't want it to be burdensome for people's yeah. workflow. So how exactly are we going to be um, so I, I don't think that the answer for how do we make a more AI driven city government and I, you know, I'm always a little bit hesitant. I think AI is a really powerful, great tool. I don't think it's the right tool for every problem. So we're really focused on like, how do we do thoughtful AI innovation? But I totally hear you. We have five minutes. Um, I will quickly say. Um, the AI action plan definitely has a lot of actions in it that are not related to algorithmic tools reporting, but are related to upskilling and understanding better what the needs are of the city workforce, um, both in terms of um, procurement needs. So what tools city agencies might be needing that they don't have access to because of whatever procurement requirements. Um, and then also in terms of like the skills of actual city employees. Um, so how can we upskill the city's workforce to better be able to take advantage of these tools? Um, so those are definitely things we're working on. I think it's separate from the local law 35 reporting in the sense that um, it's not gonna immediately lead to like a new tool needing to be reported. Like just because you procure Tableau doesn't mean you need to report that to us. But um, uh, we do hope that um, by easing procurement uh, processes or at least making those procurement requirements more clear to agencies um, and then helping them upskill their workforce, that will lead to the innovation that may lead to the adoption of tools that would like downstream be reported. Yeah, right there. Oh my God, there are so many questions. Um, I Please come talk to me afterwards if I don't get to your question. I want to talk to you. Um, also, you can email us at ai.oti.myc.gov uh, uh, um, is an inbox that I we check. So um, that's an easy an easy one to write down, I hope. Um, yeah, one more. Thank yeah. you so much for this talk. Um, I'm just wondering that uh, it seems like the reason why people would want this reporting is to be aware of any discrimination or uh, <laughs> yeah. algorithms that could be harming people. Yeah. What kind of guardrails exist for that already? Or so I think that that's something that really right now agencies are on their own in terms of thinking about. I, I, I don't want to say that because we don't have our hands on it, agencies aren't doing it. They are absolutely thinking about these things and taking the, those concerns very seriously. Um, we do not like currently have uh, a scheme under which we are, you know, it, it's something that we're thinking about. How do we give agencies better advice about um, approaching those kinds of evaluations and um, how do we help them think about those things? I don't know that it would necessarily, I mean, unless city council wants to pass a law about it, which um, I would love to talk to them about what kind of laws make sense for that. You know, I, you, you want to, again, you don't want to be overly burdensome, but you also, it's a, it's a tightrope. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a great question. I think that agencies are really working on it. We are not totally involved in that process yet, but we are um, thinking about ways that we can help them think about it and share that knowledge with other agencies. Um, I am at time, unfortunately, so I do not want to jump into another question, um, but please uh, feel free to catch me later. And also uh, AI at oti.myc.gov uh, will also get to me eventually.